Our scripture reading for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 13. Sexual immorality defiles the church. It is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you, and of a kind that is not found even among pagans, for a man is living with his father's wife, and you are arrogant. Should you not rather have mourned so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you? For though absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the man who has done such a thing. When you are assembled, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not a good thing. Do you not know that a little yeast leavens the whole batch of dough? Clean out the old yeast so that you may be a new batch, as you really are unleavened. For our paschal lamb, Christ, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us celebrate the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and evil, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Sexual immorality must be judged. I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexual, sexually immoral persons not at all meaning the immoral of this world or the greedy and robbers or idolaters, since you would then need to go out of the world. But now I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister, who is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater, reviler, drunkard, or robber. Do not even eat with such a one for what have I to do with judging those outside? Is it not those who are inside that you are to judge? God will judge those outside. Drive out the wicked person from among you. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Val. Oh my, oh my, oh my. What in the world is going on here, right? Didn't Jesus himself tell us in Matthew chapter 7 in the Sermon on the Mount? In fact, let me read it for you. He said, do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. Verse 3, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? So as Christians, aren't we supposed to just love one another, right? We love the sinner but hate the sin. Was it, wasn't Jesus the friend of sinners? Didn't he spend time with and eat meals with tax collectors, the prostitute, and the morally corrupt? Yeah, I think so. What do you think? Yeah, right. And, and while you're pondering that question, this is actually a good place for me to pause. And so hold that thought, hold that page. We're going we're gonna to return to the, our Bible, so hold that page. Okay, so aloha mai kako. Aloha. Okay, so we're continuing our sermon series titled, The Bible Doesn't Say That. The purpose, again, of this series is to address, to clarify our misunderstandings that have crept its way into our church. So we have to come, and we have come to believe, because they are in prevalent in the church, we have come to believe certain phrases as biblical, but in actuality, they never came from the Bible. There may have certain truisms about that phrase. For example, love the sinner. That's, that's true, right? But hate the sin? Well, in that context, that's not what the Bible says. And as God's children, we should know what the Bible does say because we represent God here on earth. And just as importantly, we're supposed to believe that the Bible is an inspired word of God and it was given to us to help us develop our relationship with God. That's all true, okay? But as I've been saying, reading the Bible, in my opinion, is the best way that I know how to understand what the Bible does say. Doesn't that make sense? 
right? We should read the Bible to know what it says. Because if we don't read the Bible, then we can't know what it says. So back to um, today's phrase, the misconception, okay, what the Bible doesn't say. Love the sinner, and hate, but hate the sin, which is often misunderstood and is translated as, we just need to love our neighbors as ourselves. You know, we need to forgive everybody, forgive, forgive, forgive. You know, we need to overlook their sins and their character flaws. Don't judge them. Don't judge their actions, their actions. <coughs> because as Jesus instructed in Matthew chapter 7 on the Sermon on the Mount, don't do that because we're going to be judged. No, 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 we can't do that because we don't want to be judged. Because in actuality, it's all going to work out in the end. Ultimately, all we need is love, right? How many of you are familiar with this phrase? Love the sinner and hate the sin. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I actually um, talked about this in, in our worship committee. And they're like, no, nope, never heard that before. Well, well. I'm glad I could introduce it to you. But the, like the comic strip character Calvin from Calvin and Hobbes, okay? Um, like the, how many of you have needed to use this phrase before? Yeah? Or oh, just me? You and me, Kathy. We're, we're, we're the only ones who have sinned and we need love. Okay, well, it's understandable. It's understandable. Because, but think about it this way. All of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That's a specific quote from the Bible in the um, book of Romans. The apostle Paul tells us, he's arguing with the Romans and then making his point and saying that all have sinned. We've all sinned. Some of you are looking at me like, not me. Uh, I'm just telling you, you have, okay? You, I do, it is, that's true. We've all sinned and we've all fallen short of the glory of God. So as a person on the receiving end of any judgment or receiving criticism, I want to be accepted, right? I want to be forgiven of my flaws. Doesn't that make sense? Right? And God gives us this. And that's the good news. That's the gospel. Because as, as other Christian, the other Christian um, cliche goes, we're forgiven, but we're just not perfect, right? Forgiven, but not perfect. Anybody hear that one before? No, you never. Well, people, I've heard Christians use that as an excuse because of their character flaws. It's, well, I'm forgiven. I'm just not perfect. I'm, I'm being perfected. When in actuality, it's an excuse because they're not being I, well, I, well, we're not supposed to judge, right? Isn't that what Jesus said? <laughs> okay. So, so um, and that actually is not in the Bible. I'm forgiven, but perf not perfected. So which is it? Is, is it, so do we as the church or don't we as the church judge others? Because Jesus said not to judge. But the apostle Paul here tells us, is telling the church in Corinth that he already judged the man that was living in sin. Confusing, isn't it? Is it just semantics or are we missing the point? Like the... Uh, unemployed man who was at a job interview and he was asked what's your greatest strength so the man replied i am incapable of understanding criticism <laughs> the interviewer questioned his answer by saying that sounds more like a weakness to which the man replied why thank you <laughs> see the problem the problem as dallas willard identified scholar, theologian, pastor, um, is that, quote, truth does not accommodate belief. Belief has to accommodate, and it, in my understanding, it has to conform to truth. No one has ever made a proposition true by just believing it, end quote. Meaning that if I, if I just say to myself and I, and I think to myself, I believe that I can fly. I believe that I can fly. That's my proposition. But is that true? No. If I step off of this stage here, I'm still going to fall. Gravity is going to make sure of that. Because that's true. Gravity is true, right? There's just those certain laws. Right. So meaning, meaning that we need to seek. We need to understand. We need to know the truth. Because the truth 
will set us free, as Jesus said. For Jesus says he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through him. And that as we seek the truth, genuinely humble ourselves, as Proverbs tells us, before the Lord, the Holy Spirit sanctifies us, and he does something within us. What do I mean? Well, our beliefs, our beliefs are what drives and causes us to do what we do. Not just what we say, because I, I, can, I can say, you know what, I, I want to eat healthier. I'm not going to eat chicken or fried chicken skin anymore. But that's not true. I'm saying it, but truth be told, when action comes, when the rubber meets the road, I'll probably take a bite of the chicken skin, especially if it's fried, right? Yeah. Why eat chicken if you're not going to eat the skin? That's, that's what I say, but that's just me. But I know it's unhealthy. So see that conflict? See? So, as the, but the good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ is that God's will for our lives is for us to be sanctified, which is simply another way of saying that God wants us to be conformed to the image of his son, his son Jesus. How do we do that? By knowing the truth, by knowing and living and following. And that's what the Bible does say. When we humble ourselves, as Proverbs said, knowledge, we gain knowledge. Which brings us to what I personally think is our challenge. And, and it, it is complex. I'm, I'm simplifying, and it's not as simple as, as how I'm making it out to be, but, but we need to start somewhere, right? Okay. So our challenge is that, which can be basically summed up by Gandhi's statement about Christians. He said, quote, I like your Christ. I do not like your Christians. Your Christians are so unlike your Christ, end quote. Ouch. Right? Our challenge, or part of, right, because it's complex, is that we don't understand Christ. We don't understand God. We don't know the truth. We don't know his will. We don't know how to fulfill it. Um, what we knew, do know how to do is follow a lot of rules and regulations, and we come to church on Sunday mornings, but, but thinking that's going to change us, but that doesn't change our, our belief systems. Okay? doesn't change our lives. We don't understand that as Christians, we are apprentices, our actual apprentices of Jesus, meaning that we are supposed to represent and be like Jesus. How? Again, by submitting our will to the Holy Spirit who lives in us. But for so long, people who claim to be Christians, followers of Christ, have not acted like Christ, as Gandhi noted. Instead, instead, they, or instead we, myself included, have swung the pendulum on the side of being known as what um, author and theologian Philip Yancey, who's wrote, written extensively about grace and so forth, uh, he explained in an interview with Relevant, in, a, in an inter interview that he was doing with Relevant ma Magazine, okay, and he says, quote, when you interview non-Christians and just ask them, tell me, tell me about Christians, tell me what you know about Christians, they use words like judgmental, self-righteous, hypocritical, and then a lot of anti-words. They're anti-science, they're anti-gay, they're anti-abortion, they're probably anti-sex, end quote. So that was um, Philip Yancey explaining okay, the situation that we're in. And, but, and I just had a thought. Surprisingly, most conservative Christians are not anti-gun, right? Anti-gun control, which is as, well, okay, I won't go there. Okay, as Christians, as Christians, we've gotten the reputation of being the moral police in society. Somewhere, somehow along the line, along the way, in my opinion, we've misappropriated our authority by trying to project our values onto the world and to one another. 
meaning that we've mixed up truth, right? Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, with our responsibility. What are we supposed to actually do? For example, here's a stunning, funny story that's told of um, D.L. Moody, Dwight L. Moody, and Charles Spurgeon, both great preachers of the 19th century, giants in the faith, used by God to, to, to bring forth his kingdom here on earth. So two giants, okay? As the story is told, they once met in London, where Charles Spurgeon lived, and, and Moody, who lived in the United States, was visiting London and, and had an opportunity to meet Charles Spurgeon, who he greatly admired. Okay? So he was looking forward to their meeting with enthusiasm. So when Spurgeon came to the door of his home, like Dwight Moody knocked, Spurgeon came to the door, he had a cigar in his mouth. Moody was appalled, and he stammered, how could you, a man of God, smoke that thing? <coughs> Excuse me, pointing to the cigar. Um, Spurgeon took the cigar from his mouth, as the story is told, smiled, put his finger on Moody's fat stomach, his huge stomach, and said, the same way you, a man of God, could be that fat. See, it's, it's easy to point fingers, right? It, it truly is. It's easy to point fingers and make accusations. And sadly, the Christian church has done a lot of finger pointing. And we've become known for judging others, known as the spiritual watchdogs of our society. And consequently, we have been labeled. We've been labeled intolerant. We've been labeled judgmental and even hypocritical. Yeah, but when you read the Bible, Jesus was accused of hanging around the sinners, the prostitutes, the tax collectors, thieves, the morally corrupt. He was accused of hanging out with the wrong, the wrong crowd all the time. See, but our criticism and judgment of the world, right, us, the Christian church, has turned off We've repelled the wrong crowd, whereas Jesus attracted them. Rather than communicating that we are apprentices of Christ and that we have living water, that we actually have a relationship with God, we have alienated ourselves from those who need Jesus. So I can understand how the pendulum has swung. Well, maybe it actually hasn't because from my perspective, there have always been and there still is two extremes, right? On one side, we have the critical, judgmental Christians. And on the other side, we have the accommodating. Oh, God is love. Everyone, you got to accept everyone for who they are. Don't worry about it. God's going to work it out all in the end. See, but the Bible doesn't say that, and, and it certainly doesn't say that we are to love the sinner and hate the sin. And the Bible doesn't say that either. You know, can everybody read that? The, the, the mime is saying, people be like, only God can judge me. And I be like, hey, that should scare you. Well, and in actuality, there's a lot of truth to that, Okay. Especially if you're not, you don't have a relationship with God. Okay. So, so what does the Bible actually say about judging others? So in Matthew chapter 7, again, Jesus instructs the crowd, do not judge so that you may not be judged. For with the judgment you make, you will be judged. And the measure you give will be the measure you get. And, and, and that's where most people who don't read the Bible or who don't know the Bible and don't understand the Bible and don't understand God end the quote. Right? Jesus said, don't judge, and they stop there. But in actuality, there's more to the passage. Okay? The passage doesn't stop there. Verse 3, Jesus continues, Why do you see the speck in your neighbor's eye, but do not notice the log in your own eye? Or how can you say to your neighbor, let me take the speck out of your eye while the log is in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. Then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your neighbor's eye. See, in this context, 
passage isn't simply talking about judging, do judge or don't judge. No, no, no. It's actually talking about being a hypocrite and then judging others. So before we judge others, we're to examine ourselves and our motives. Why are we doing what we're doing, right? And it's not just in judging, it's in everything to self-assess. Then in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse, what um, Val read for us, I'm not going to read, read the whole passage, but starting in verse 9, Paul instructs the church not to associate with sexually immoral persons. But there's a caveat. See, verse 10, not, not and he's, he's saying, he's explaining, that doesn't mean don't is- associate with the immoral people of the world or the greedy or the robbers or the idolaters, since if you did that, then you would have to leave the world. Right? That's what Paul is saying. Verse 11, but now I'm writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister. So he's talking about within the church, that those within the church are to hold each other accountable. And he's saying, who is sexually immoral or greedy or is an idolater or a reviler or a drunkard or robber, do not even eat with them. That's what Paul's saying. Paul is saying to, in his letter to Corinth, and Paul's addressing a lot of the issues, a lot of issues in, to his letters in Corinth. Right now, we only have two in the Bible, but we actually have... Um, archived artifacts that, that show that Paul wrote many letters to, because there was a messed up church and he was trying to deal with a lot of their issues. And this was just one of them. Verse 12, for what have I to do with jo- judging those on the outside? So Paul's explaining to the church, hey, who am I to judge what they do on the outside? Our values are different. Why should I judge them? Is it not those who are in the inside that we are to judge? God will judge those on the outside. And then he instructs them to drive out that wicked person from among you. So everybody understand what Paul's saying? Okay? There's a difference. We're supposed to take care of and be responsible for our family. Does that make sense? Right? Our family, if we are truly a family, we're supposed to take care of one another. We're supposed to be accountable to one another. We're supposed to to help and serve, but also teach and correct one another. That's what he's saying. So those who are inside of the church, that's who we're supposed to take care of and hold accountable to actually judge. And then, and then, we as the church are supposed to trust God and expect Him to judge those who are outside of the family, those who are in the world. Let me il- illustrate my points with, with a couple of stories. Okay. So first story, first story, there, there was... a. Um, a small church in a, in a small town in rural, let's say, the Midwest, okay? But within the church, there was one particular uh, member of the congregation. Let's, let's name her Maureen. Nobody here is named Maureen, right? So let's name her Maureen, okay? So Maureen, Maureen um, was a real gossip, you know? And, and, and she viewed herself as responsible for maintaining the congregation's morals, most of the members didn't really like her, but they were too afraid to say anything about her. They didn't want to get on her bad side. Okay, everybody kind of understand what's going on. Okay. Then one day, then one day, a new member of the congregation, his name was, um, we have Jack, Ralph. We don't have a Ralph here. Okay, let's say his name is Ralph. Ralph left his pickup truck parked all afternoon outside the town's one and only bar. Okay, of course, this was spotted by Maureen, who accused Ralph of being an alcoholic. And she told him and the other members of the congregation that everyone who saw the truck there would know what he was doing. Well, Ralph was a quiet man who didn't talk much, right? 
And, and, and here, when he was accused of being an alcoholic, he didn't say anything at all. He just stared at Maureen for a, for a long while. <sighs> Frustrated, he sighed, and then he walked away without trying to come up with any explanations or an excuse. But later that evening, Ralph parked his car outside of Maureen's house. And then left it there all night. Right, 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 right. Point, my point of this story is that, is that Ralph, in his love for Maureen, gently taught her to take the log out of her own eye before judging others. Okay? Second story, second story, um, personal story. So when, when I, my children were younger, you know, I would take them to the playground, um, especially when we lived like in Pasadena, there would be like some great like public parks and great playgrounds up there. But then obviously, since it's a public park, there'd be kids from all over, right? Not just the neighborhood, but like we would drive in to, to play at this park, like Griffin Park and different parks like that. Okay, and then and as, as expected, because um, there are kids from all over, right? Some kids are more well-behaved than other children, and, and other children are just running wild, running wild through the, the park and the playground and through the different gym equipment. And, and you know, as, as a father, I, I want to protect my children, so I, I did. And then there are several instances where, um, yeah, there, it was just situations where conflict could have arose. Whether like the child pushed my kids out of the way to, to climb up on the slide or something, or pushed my, my daughter out of the way to jump on the swing or something. And, and it, I could have easily gotten angry, and I could have easily confronted the child, and I could have easily scolded the child. And great, right, because I'm an adult, and I'm actually, I was one of few parents that's actually with the children. Like most of the parents are just sitting on the side or they're, they're just talking amongst themselves and not watching their kids, and, you know? And it's e it would be easy for me to judge and e easy for me to correct and easy for me to... But I, I had a revelation then. I just thought, well, let me, let me ask you. If someone started scolding your child, right, and you don't know what the context of it, well, how would you feel? You wouldn't like it, right? I, I, I personally would, would try to find out what happened. You know, if someone started escorting my child, I'd, I'd want to protect my child, and, and I would want to find out what happened. So, so the revelation was, because I don't have a relationship with these children, right? There's no relationship. I really don't have any authority to speak into their lives. So are they going to listen? No. Are the parents going to listen? No. So what I did was I protected, I, I took care of my children, I did what... And sometimes we, I just had to remove my children. I had to remove my children from the situation because it was, it was unsafe for them, right? So in, in essence, what I'm, what I'm trying to say is... is and, and, and don't, don't misunderstand me. If, if they were hitting my children, I would, I'd step in right away, right, if there's the, to protect them. But again, again, would it have done any good for me to exert my imaginary authority over someone else's child? No. But in actuality, that's kind of what um, the church is doing in a lot of areas, especially in, in government, and we, we become very vocal and we become known for certain rights that, that we want to protect or kind of thing. So what I'm saying, what I'm saying is, is yes, I, I, I would, I need to focus my attention and my love on my children, and the church needs to do that within our community. Because as the Bible tells us, it's by our love, our love, okay, for one another. Meaning that when we so love each other here in the church, the people outside of the church go, wow, 
I want to be a part of that. I need that. I, I need to, I need forgiveness. I need grace. I, I need to be corrected in a way that it's not. So when we ho- hold each other accountable, accountability isn't, everybody see that? Some of you are sleeping. No. <laughs> accountability isn't a slap on the hand. A- accountability is, you know, Sally, I love you so much, and I know that's not what God wants for you, and that's not God's best for your life. And I will walk with you through what you're going through. Right? Phyllis, accountability isn't that, oh, you need to do this and this and this. It's, no, how can I help? You guys get it? You see the difference? It's easy to just say things and tell people what to do and what not to do. But Jesus is asking us to put our money where our mouth is, to actually walk with people through what they're going through. And that, that is huge. That's a commitment. But that's what God has called us to. And it starts with loving on one another and walking with each other and fulfilling God's will in us and through us. What is God's will for our lives? Be to be sanctified, which simply means becoming more and more like Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit. I have trouble enough doing that without worrying about what's going on in the world. But and, and I, I share this with my huddle a lot in, our, in our, um, our Monday night huddles is a group of leaders. It's open to the church. Anybody want to come join us on Monday nights, please feel free to come. Um, we have been on a certain curriculum, so it, it might feel a little awkward assimilating in. But hey, we're loving people, right, Kathy? We're loving people. I, I, I say that to our church is that, you know, the power of accountability is that when we are together, Think about this, because you are not your same self, whether you're, you're critical or you're judgmental or whether you're, you're short-tempered or whether you're, you're not your same self. You're not who your family knows who you are here in church. We're different people here in church because regardless of what we are, because, and not just because of the social norms that we need to act like, no, no, no. In church, we are forgiven. In church, we are filled with the Holy Spirit. In church, we have a mission. In church, I would would not act the same way. My wife tells me all the time, you wouldn't talk like that to your church members, right? When I'm talking, and and she corrects me and says, you're right. And I apologize for that. So what we do is we the church is in a building. The church is the people of God, the community of God coming together. And that's who we are. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ, that we are invited into this community because we can't do it by ourselves, as I've been saying. I can't do it by myself. I need you, and you need me. And as we do it together, the Holy Spirit empowers us and leads us. But the goal has always been and will always be to love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and then to be apprentices of Jesus who make apprentices of Jesus, to teach other people how to do this. Because that is what life is really about. Amen? Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you again and again and again for your grace, which is so amazing. It is through this gift of love that you have bestowed upon us that we have life through your son, Jesus. And we choose to worship him. We choose to surrender our hearts, our minds, and our wills to him, Lord. Continue to sanctify us, Lord. Continue to do what you need to do so that we would be true to you. We pray for our brothers and sisters who are not here, who are not able to make it. 
We pray for their sanctification as well. Bring forth healing where there's healing. Support us in each and every way that you know how, Lord. This we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen.